want to know your, your I want to know your opinion on um, how do I say this without sounding weird? I don't know why I should care because there's only two people here. I'm like, what are you guys gonna do? Talk about me? Like. Well, I mean, this is recorded, but no one knows who you are, so it's fine. I mean, this is an ethics class as well, so weird questions are kind of the norm. The Reddit Roach guy. What? The Reddit Roach guy. I have no idea who that is. I'm not that permanently online, I guess. Um, he posted something admitting to his girlfriend that I that he pretends that she's a giant cockroach when she has when he has sex. Oh, and I've seen things making fun of this. Was this an actual thing? Yes. It came, it, 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 it was posted seven years ago. You gotta take this with It was posted seven years ago. Okay, yeah. so I'm gonna uh, just assume a lot about this situation. First of all, that it happened, and it wasn't just somebody trolling. Before you do that. Just for the sake of argument, for the sake of analysis. Yeah, go ahead. Before you do that, let me, let me, let me explain what the cockroach is from. Uh, what? It's from, um, it's from Metamorphosis. Oh, okay. But, yeah. And That's he's just point, I'm actually really familiar with that. thinking about the roach being a woman instead of a man. Okay. Um, mm. And apparently he found the idea very arousing and eventually okay. he went from feeling much shame about it Good. to <laughs> he had performance issues when he couldn't think about the roach. Dad. Okay, so you know what? Let's dive into the thought experiment. Why not? This is a fun day. Sure. I mean, this is the, honestly, uh, now, as weird as this is, as bizarre of an example as this might be, okay. this would make a decent case analysis. Like, that, but don't convince me to do this. I'm going to do it now. So I'm going to do it now. So don't necessarily, but I mean, if you, let me put it this way. If you have more to say about the matter than we talk about now, by all means, you can. But I do want to briefly talk about it because it is an interesting, albeit really weird, but interesting case. So, yeah. Um, so, we have a distinction we can make between, um, oh, what's the term? There's terminology for this, in fact. Um, something like occurrent passions and, oh, what's the other term? Passions proper, like passions properly speaking. So passions properly speaking are passions which are which not just don't just kind of pop into our minds, but things that we consider, entertain, and to some degree encourage. Those we're morally responsible for. We're not morally responsible necessarily for things that just pop unbidden into their into our minds, like reading Kafka's Metamorphosis and thinking, what if that was a pretty lady? Hmm. That okay. That's a weird thought. Intrusive thought, perhaps. Intrusive thoughts happen. We're not necessarily morally responsible for them. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly what happened in this case, but it's a possibility and it's something we can consider and something to, to draw at a useful distinction. Um, that said, thoughts like that can come to us because of our habits and virtues and vices. You might, in fact, have a particular intrusive thought, something that just sort of pops unbidden into your mind because you've thought about other things in particular ways. So if, uh, if this, oh, I wonder if, that, uh, I wonder if that cockroach is really a pretty lady, comes bursting into your mind unbidden, but it's because, um, because, say, you're used to reading trashy romance novels, let's say, rather than uh, Kafkaesque horror stories. And then you accidentally get sort of get those things cross-wired in your mind because you're very used to reading something else. Well, that's a habit that you've sort of developed. Expecting certain things to come when reading. Now, that can, those kinds of habits can, be, uh, can lead to um, not just these thoughts just popping up, but then we can choose to entertain them and choose to consider them and then sort of internalize the thought process, which is presumably what something like what happened next. That rather than saying, oh, why am I thinking that? And embracing the shame, so to speak, he embraced the action instead, um, or the thought process, rather, instead, and developed a sort of mental habit. And I say mental here, 
although uh, presumably reinforced physically, so to speak, but uh, we developed a kind of habit of thought, a habit of thinking, which is largely what we think of, or what, we, what we're talking about when we're talking about virtues, character virtues. Because usually when we're talking about a virtue, we're not talking about a habit like, like say, me chewing my nails. I've chewed my nails for a long time, since I was a kid. And it's something I just sort of do, a physical action that I do without thinking. Virtues or vices are things that we think without thinking, thoughts that come to us unbidden, but then we choose to allow them to stay there, keep acting, be maintained in our mind, that sort of thing. And so we can kind of split, split his responsibility here. Maybe this thought came to him completely unbidden and there was nothing he really did to bring it about, but then, presumably at least, he chose to entertain the thought and allow it to take up residence in his mind and perhaps uh, reinforce said thought uh, with presumably the pleasures of sex, which does quite a lot for whether that's actual sex or whether that's you know, masturbation or whatever he did. Who knows? Who knows where this began? I don't want to. Um, <laughs> no one really wants to, uh, I hope. In any case, though, um, that, kind of, that kind of reinforcement of thought patterns forms habits of thought much more quickly and effectively if you're reinforcing it by action. This can also go with, uh, go positively, say. Um, let's, let's move away from, from weird cockroach sex stuff and talk instead about, say, um, habit formation with respect to, say, healthy eating, for example. You might have some kind of a food that you don't like or haven't liked or when you were a kid you didn't like, right? I didn't like broccoli when I was a kid. Like most kids don't, presumably, right? Um, but what you can do if you find something that you know you should like but you don't is that you can start practicing thinking of it as palatable. Not even like, mm, delicious, because it's really hard to lie to yourself. But it's easy enough to think of, well, this is food and that I should eat it. And it's part of this other, say, cooking it with a dish that you like. Okay, and that starts to form your habits of thought. Thinking of, in this case, broccoli as, instead of ew, thinking of it as, okay, food. And then eventually, once you've formed your habit to thinking of the thing as food, then you can go further and say, okay, this is a dish that I might even prefer. Not thinking about the broccoli itself, but that idea of the broccoli as part of this larger picture of the thing that I like, the thing that I'm choosing then because it's part of the thing that you're choosing, you can then gradually develop the habit of liking broccoli as part of this other, this dish or this habit of eating, say. And eventually, you can actually start pulling that apart and saying, okay, I don't just prefer this dish which happens to have broccoli in it. The broccoli in it is part of this dish which is good. And you can start to form the connection between broccoli and delicious food and not just nutrition that I have to stomach. This is a process that most of us go through, right? Most of us go through this process, whether consciously or not, from there are all sorts of foods that we don't like when we're kids, but that we grow into. Usually we do that by just eating it and thinking of it as if it's food and it happens and it works. Um, like I said, you can do this positively or you can do this negatively. You can start um, getting yourself to like something that you shouldn't, or you can start getting yourself to like something that you should, or you can start getting yourself to be averse to something that you should like, or you can start getting yourself to, uh, what's the other opposite? Uh, like stuff you should be averse to. Yes, sure, yeah. You can do either way, either one, either way, in other words. And usually, again, it's a gradual process of habituation, which is why I think that this, uh, that it's important to note with the, with the cockroach sex Reddit guy, that this was not something, even saying those words is not great. It's an ethics class. <laughs> we're gonna say weird stuff. <laughs> um, we're getting into this part of the semester where we are talking about case studies. And case studies are weird, usually intentionally, because the weird cases are the interesting cases where they have interesting moral significance. In this case, part of, uh, part of what I think that, again, even just from, from at least what you've said of the account and what little I know about it, um, this is not something that just sort of happened. 
or something that he just said, you know what, I'm going to develop a weird fetish for cockroaches. Like, that didn't just happen. It is something that occurred over the course of other tangentially related choices that he made over and over and over again. Until the point where, as you said, he has performance issues when he's not thinking of his girlfriend as a giant cockroach. How's that in terms of analysis? I mean, it was pretty good. And okay. if it makes you feel better, she, I believe that she broke up with him. I, I get it. I probably would, too. <laughs> I wouldn't blame you. I, I don't think I would. Um, What's the weirdest case study you've ever had submitted to you? Ooh. Hmm. Or if there's a few. Because I'm so back. curious how weird these get. It has been a little while since I've taught this class. And so it's been a couple years. I'm trying to think back to what was the strangest. Oh, I did have some. <laughs> Just by you laughing before you even finish. It's another sex thing because, of course, those are the weirdest. I'm sorry. Um, even another. Do so you know John McAfee? John McAfee was an uh, internet security guy who ran for president in 2020, um, who was suicided recently. Um, by which I mean he, uh, he didn't kill himself. Right, he was, he was arrested for, uh, for a lot of things. Um, what, actually, what, he was actually, what he was actually wound up being charged with was, uh, was I believe, tax evasion, because that's what they get all these people for. Um, he was also, uh, I think when he, when he died, I think he was still wanted for murder in, I think it was Bolivia. Um, because he, uh, he, he, this is also strange. This wasn't part of the case study that somebody had analyzed, but this guy's life story is just, this guy's life story is just a fascinating array of what the hell is going on here. So it's all worth analyzing. Um, he, he shot and killed his, uh, the pimp of a, prostitute he had fallen in love with because he was he was threatening her to keep her in the job and so he he shot and killed the guy and then he married her oh. yeah he's a he's a fascinating individual that's now the case just that's just curious. one part of a fascinating life yeah um he was uh but yeah no he uh he was also suicided like he 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 was he uh, quote killed himself in jail, um, less than a month after writing an extensive letter about about uh, saying essentially, I'm not suicidal. I have no I have no depression or dark thoughts. I have a lot to live for, and if I uh, and if it turns out that I quote kill myself, um, there will be a lot of infor information released about a lot of powerful people. And then he died about a month later, obviously due to suicide, of course. Yeah. Anyway, um, that wasn't the case. None of that was actually the case that anybody analyzed because at the time he was still alive and he hadn't been arrested yet or anything like that. Um, the case was about when he fucked a whale. How did he get it in? <laughs> that's your first question. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good really question. Really, how did he get access to? Oh wait, no, that's actually pretty easy. Um, in the ocean. Yeah. Wait. It like yes. A live. Live whale. I don't know all the details. I don't know all the details. Um, yes. Um, he, in fact, part of the case analysis was his defense of this because a lot of people were saying, well, come on, and, and a, wild, a wild animal can't consent, obviously, and so there are serious issues with this. Fair enough. But his point, his counter to this, which the case analysis went into, was that, look, I am a land animal. I was in the ocean with a 2,000 pound creature with very large teeth. If it did not consent, I would have known about it. Which, Sorry, it's a strange situation and he was a strange guy and he could have been our president. So, oh, no, no, he ran in 2016, not 2020, 2016. He's such an odd critter. Oh yeah. Fascinating. That is, that is straight up one bestiality, which is well, yes. So there, are, that ha that carries its own problems, obviously, which are which are separate to the consent issue. Um, but I mean, 
can get into that if need be. But uh, in any case, though, that that was probably the strangest case analysis. And it was something that I had been aware of beforehand, which is another odd one. There was another particularly odd one. I don't remember all of the details, um, but it was um, it was basically a uh, it was a news it was a news story about a group of teenagers who um, who were trying to derail a train as a practical joke and wound up all dying. Or I don't I don't remember if all of them died, but some of them did. Yeah, I think I, I think I heard about this. Was yeah. it just two? I think there were three involved. Two of them might have it might have been two died or something. Two died. It might have been something like that. But yeah, they were trying to derail a train because it would be funny. And you know, is it the thing where they pretend like putting the pennies on, or something? No, it was something more elaborate than that. Um, it, it, was, it was something, so something like that, but uh, don't, right? It's a really bad idea. I, I also, by the way, the putting a penny on a railroad track will not derail a train. That's ridiculous. Um, so don't, I mean, don't do it. Because you might die. Because playing around railroad tracks is not the safest thing in the world, no, uh, particularly if there's if there's a train coming. Not really. Not dying. Are you sure it's illegal to walk along railroad tracks that are active? On them? Yes. Like on them. Um, on them. Um, across them, not necessarily. Not across them, but, but like, like along walking them. along. Yes. I'm, in most places, I think. I know so. that because I was not allowed to take photos on the track. <laughs> 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 not not for any necessary reason or anything. I. I see what you're, I see what you're getting. Through. I mean, look, I, we've all done, we've all, we've all presumably done things that, that uh, if photos were taken, it would lead to legal trouble at least once in a while. Um, if you've lived in Florida f for long enough and haven't ridden a manatee, or at least pet one, I know that's not. The one. I'm scared. Okay, they're, they're cute. I screamed so loud because one of them popped up while me yeah. and my dad were kayaking. One of them popped up, and I screamed so loud that I went back down. Oh, no. And it, <laughs> I came back up. I, I don't get the thing. When it approaches you, it's different. Yeah. No, no. If you're, yeah. And I was, this was when I was swimming in, a, in one of the springs over a little bit north of here. I think yeah, it was Crystal, Crystal River. River. I think it was Crystal River. Definitely Crystal River. It might have been Rainbow Springs. It might have been Rainbow Springs. Rainbow? They, I don't know how many. It was a while ago. I was, I think I was in Rainbow middle school or so. River? The springs at Rainbow River, I think. It, might, it was either there or it might have been Crystal River. I'm not sure. It was one of those up there. Either way, uh, either way, I was, uh, I was swimming around, and there were a bunch of manatees around. One of them just kind of comes over and just kind of like goes alongside me, and so I'm just like, oh. And then rode it down the river for, you know, 30 feet or so. And it was totally fine with this. Like, again, don't go harass the animal. Yeah. But they are very kind, friendly creatures, and sometimes they'll just come up and bump you, so go for it. Um, don't go for it. That's illegal, technically. The but photo of that manatee that people found that had the bird carved into its back. It, it wasn't carved. It was, it was algae. I say carved. I've done that too. <laughs> Not words, I but I, but you can like. Back. No, um, because uh, they manatees because they're very slow moving in in very nutrient rich very water. Easy. They get a lot of uh, of algae and even things like barnacles growing on them, yeah. and so if you like. If you like take your fingertip, not even your nail, and just kind of go like oh, yeah. that, uh, you can make a nice little line on a manatee. Um, <laughs> like, I've accidentally done that. I've never really looked into it. I just saw the image of it. Yeah. And I was like, is it scratched or is it carved or is it algae? Uh, yeah. Scary. And I, when I saw it at first, I was like, oh, that's not good. And then I looked more closely, and I'm like, oh, never mind. That's just skin. <laughs> um, it looks like somebody thought it would be funny and did something that wouldn't really hurt the manatees. I'm like, all right, fine, whatever. And then people took it and ran with it. Right. Right, and I mean, another, that's another one of those cases where being upset about that sort of thing begins with good, with good intentions, right? You don't, seeing what at least appears to be harm done to an innocent creature is not a good thing. I mean, you don't like that because it's wrong, but, yeah. but then looking into it with a little bit more detail, you realize, oh, well, I mean, harm wasn't actually done. Manatee got back scratches. <laughs> Which, I mean, they also say that touching a manatee is illegal. Technically, in, yes. In a but manner, which technically, is, yeah. But so is speeding, and come on. They are. Um, I think they're only protected now. I could be wrong about that. Don't, again, don't quote me. But I know they've been... I think that they're just protected. They have, they, ha they have had a lot of, uh, of population recovery throughout my lifetime, at least. Actually, a lot of a lot of uh, endangered species in Florida, Florida especially, has been really good about that. 
the same. Oh my God, the Sandhill Cranes. They're still protected and they know it. They know it. I know. And they know it too. They're very aware of that. They will walk very slowly in front of your vehicle. Little bastards. Yeah. Not little, not little bastards. Yeah, which is a shame because they look delicious. Another protected one is the Are they really? I didn't know that. Yeah, those ones are all, you're not supposed to touch them, but one came up with a puppy dog and I could not say no. <laughs> the, the whole point of that is, well, there's two points of it. One is not harassing the wild animals. Two is so that they don't become overly comfortable with human beings because that can be dangerous to them. Right, because then you know they will just kind of walk up to your car. Right, um, then they will just kind of walk up to your car and get run over, which is not good. Um, or they'll walk up to somebody who who will you know shoot and eat them, or and not know maybe. Because I didn't know that there were any endangered deer species in Florida. No idea. I don't know if they're protected. They're disastrous. Either way, which is pretty reasonable. And for predator species especially, that becomes. That becomes quite a concern because alligators is the big example of this, that if an alligator comes up to people and you feed it enough, they start not avoiding human beings. And then if you start not avoiding human beings and then coming up to a human being and expecting food and there's a nice little finger there instead of you know a chicken finger. Okay, so they're in danger. I'll tell a story. My neighbor, I live on Chris and my neighbor owns like a fishing. Mm -hmm. takes, takes people out in the fishes. And he was like throwing his fish guts in the water, you know, like super smart. And alligator came up, you know, he created a nuisance gator. He just hangs oh, out yeah. by his little guy. So we had to call the gator hunters and get him Because you can't. I know some of those guys. Yourself. Oh, no, no, no. I know some of those guys. Yeah. I worked with some of those guys. I've mentioned I've, I, I, I've done the strangest second jobs in the world. I, I was an alligator trainer for a couple of years. And so I, I, I trained alligators for a couple of years. <coughs> I've said this before. I don't know if, it, maybe not in this class. Maybe not in this class. You did not say that in this class. I maybe not. immediately <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I have. I, I trained alligators for a couple of years uh, down at, uh, there's a place called the Alligator Attraction down at John's Pass. Um, where I, there were like 50 live alligators upstairs in, in our little little uh, attraction kind of thing. And uh, we um, let tourists come in and, and uh, feed them and pet them and take pictures with them and uh, ride on the giant one if they were, you know, passed a quick little safety quiz and all that kind of stuff. But uh, that's the only one who's like really dangerous under normal circumstances. But, um, that's not true. They're all actually quite dangerous, but we don't tell them that. Um, my job was not, I mean, yes, my job was training alligators, but my job was really making sure that the tourists, the tourists who come in don't get themselves hurt yeah. with the alligators. Not what I expected. <laughs> anyway, so, <clears throat> so I think we can, I mean, kind of wrap this back around to what we were, uh, what we were initially talking about, which was the development of, the development of skill, the development of prudence. So you... You can learn a lot, to kind of get back to this, you can learn a lot from abstract theory of how to do things. Right? I was using the example of driving a car uh, or learning a sport or whatever. You can learn a lot just from here is how you do this, here are the mechanics involved, uh, here are, if you're driving a car, here are what the various controls do. Uh, you need to, um, particularly if you've learned to drive a stick, like you can know in theory how not to pop the clutch, and when you need to have the clutch depressed, and when you need to not, and when you need to shift, and under what, like at what RPM you should probably shift to what gear, uh, and under what conditions, and all of that. But if you learn all of that, and then sit down in a stick shift vehicle, it won't work at first. Has anyone driven a stick at any point? Okay, <coughs> sounding about right? Like yes. Yeah. It makes <laughs> it makes angry noises at you in displeasure. Yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. I couldn't drive. I just came. Yeah. It's uh. It's it's a, it's a. Just like driving an, an automatic car, it's a skill that you have to acquire by doing it. Serious skill ever to start to. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, here's here's another story that when I start, first started driving, learning to drive a car back in like high school and like driver's ed class. 
Um, I, I learned the mechanics of the process, like what all of the things did and all of that stuff. And then <clears throat> what you're supposed to do is you know, be in the, like, in the parking lot and you know, drive around the trainer cars at idle speed kind of thing. So I, uh, I had just gotten my permit at the start of like, driver's ed. I hadn't like, practiced in a parking lot or anything. And I just so happened to be randomly selected for one of the first to go out on a road test, on a road drive. So um, we, were in a, uh, we were parked in a parking space and there, were, uh, there was construction equipment right behind me. And, uh, and the, the, the instructor was like, all right, just, uh, just ease out of the parking space, make sure you turn the wheel. And I was like, all right, foot off the, off the brake, onto the gas, in reverse. What I didn't realize was that the gas pedal is very sensitive. If you've driven for any length of time, you know exactly how little, how little you need to depress the gas to go. In fact, if you're backing out of a parking spot, the answer is none, typically. Yeah. I didn't realize this. I put it about halfway down. <laughs> Thankfully, there was a passenger brake yeah. before I hit the construction equipment behind me. And I needed to very gradually uh, get a feel for things. right? And now I'm a perfectly competent driver, just like most of us, who've driven for more than a month or two. It's a, it's a skill that you pick up very quickly. And we, as human beings, are actually quite good at picking up skills relatively quickly. Uh, at least the basic understanding of how to do it. But the understanding of how to do it is not in purely in the abstract intellect. There is something practical to it. That, that practicality is, to some extent, embodied. And with that, what we're talking about there is prudence. Right? That's the, the subject of this chapter. Prudence is knowing how to accomplish something that we set out to do. That can be purely abstract, at least to begin, but it also almost always includes know-how, right? technique, what we might call. So if you remember, we made that distinction, that set of, uh, that set of distinctions between um, the different parts of the, uh, the different, say, intellectual virtues or pseudo-virtues. Right, because we had um, we have understanding, science or knowledge, I think in this class we barely talked about this, but it was in the it was in the lecture that that covered, that went back over and covered this. So if you missed this, you can go back to it. Um, we barely went through this. This was in that big chart of virtues that I started doing on the board but didn't finish. Um, and then uh, theoretical wisdom. And these are the strictly intellectual virtues. These are the uh, strictly abstract, strictly intellectual virtues. These are habits of thinking. Theoretically, abstractly, not about doing something, but about things, about concepts. They each have their equivalent, which are a couple of the things that we're going to be talking about here uh, in this chapter. Going from the bottom up, we have practical wisdom. Uh, or we might call prudence. Then we have conscience. Then we have what Aquinas calls syndaresis. Yes, I think. I could be spelling that wrong. It's in the chapter. Uh, and then we also have, in addition to prudence, we also have something similar, but only you know, it's related, but some, somewhat different. Art or craftsmanship. Translation for techne, uh, the Greek term techne, uh, which is where we why we think of arts and crafts, the ability. So it. So the difference between prudence and art, both as virtues, art is knowing how to make something. Prudence is knowing how to do something. So we were talking before, uh, before class, right? You have, the, you have the, let's say, art of sewing that I lack. Right? Because I'm not particularly skilled at it. I might know theoretically how to do certain stitches because you know I, I'll repair I'll repair a button or something once in a while, but but I, again I know abstractly how these things work, but I don't have the practice, I don't have the the um, the art of being able to do so, particularly effortlessly, right? Because I mean you. I can do this while looking away and still 
Right. You're just you're paying attention to me, and I'm aware of that. Right. Even when you're not looking, even if you do need to look at it, like you're looking at it, but that's not where your attention is, and that's what, not where it needs to be, because you're just doing it. it. It's a sort of process that happens automatically. You can do other things. This is what the virtue of art means. Prudence is the equivalent for rather than making something, about acting, about doing something. Right. So. Um, for example, if, if you are, to go back to our example we've been using, if you're a particularly good driver, or even if you're just a decent, acceptable, passable driver, you're not going to be thinking about how much you need to turn the wheel to change lanes. You just will. And in fact, we get, the, we get this thing called road hypnosis, where if you've ever driven like along a highway for a significant distance, you just don't remember the intervening time at all. That has scared me before. So. Yeah, especially if it's pretty far. Right? If you've been on the, on the highway for an hour and you don't know what took you so long, you don't know where the time went, that sort of thing, that can be a little bit disturbing because... It's really comparable to like, being on autopilot in a way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Autopilot is basically just what virtue is. Virtue or habits of character, and vice for that matter, are the things that we can sort of just do automatically without effort, without thinking about it. Another good example of this sort of thing is, uh, so, I have a bouncy ball. That brings stuff for this. So suppose that I want to throw this bouncy ball into that hole in the desk. There's a hole right here. It's for like plugs and stuff, right? Okay, so I want to throw this ball into that hole. It's quite small. It'll fit in the hole, no problem. I know the angle I need to throw it. I know exactly how hard I need to throw it. Who thinks I'm going to get it? First shot. Are we not? Why not? I don't know. Oh, you kind of look like perfect for your first time. That's cool. You kind of look like you wouldn't get it the first time. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. Untaken. I know what you mean. You're right. Um, I'm no athlete. If it makes you feel better, I definitely. Right. I mean, but most people wouldn't. Like, even if, like, even if you have a pretty practiced arm for these sorts of things, you don't know the amount you, of exact force you need to. Right. You haven't dialed it in. Right. So if I do that, oh, I was actually pretty close. Glanced off the edge of it. No, I didn't. No. Um, but I was pretty close, and so I could kind of refine it. I could try again. Right. It would only take so many tries. Right. I would. I would have to. Uh, but the point is that I would have to do something, learn from my experience, and do it over. Now, if, <clears throat> if you're somebody like, um, you know Dude Perfect? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, if you're somebody like that, they do trick shots on all different, of all different kinds, whether that's throwing, whether that's shooting, whether that's arrows, whether that's Nerf guns, whether that's whatever it is, they do crazy trick shots. A lot of that does involve this kind of honing things in, practicing until it gets just right. But a lot of it is also just having an innate, practiced, non-theoretical understanding of the biomechanics involved. If you're very good at throwing something, you'll throw it. It's not like you'll have to think about, like if you're a pitcher, you're not going to have to think about, you know, how much curve to put on this curveball to get it over the plate. No, you will throw a curveball and it'll go right over the plate. It'll just happen. When you tell your arm to do it, your arm does it. Just like when you're driving, you're not going to say, I'm going to turn the wheel approximately you know, 25 degrees to the left and then invert back 10 degrees back to the right and then stabilize to change lanes. None of that happens. You're just, I need to change lanes. And then I change lanes. Right? You act on it. And so prudence is the habit of being able to just know exactly what needs to be done in order to accomplish an end. Sorting through the means to get to a particular end without having to go through um, you know, a careful calculation of thought process to do it. OK. Been 45 minutes. I've covered one of the like eight topics that this chapter covers. So let's let's go. We can keep going. That's fine. Um, now I will say as well, this is a really short chapter, like compared to the other ones. Really, this is like this is like 
eight pages or something. Yeah, this was by. I think this is by far the shortest chapter of the book. I think it's only. Nine, ten, yeah, ten pages long. So, it, and most of them have been over twenty. Uh, well, some of them have, at least. Uh, but this covers a lot of ground. Right? What I just talked about is what do we mean by prudence? What do we mean by the virtue of prudence? Well, we're talking about prudence, what it is. We're talking about conscience as well, and then what that means, and whether these two can be distinguished, and how do we distinguish them? And then. <clears throat> Once we figured out what prudence is and what conscience are and how they're different and how they relate to each other, then we have to go on and talk about, well, what about forming our conscience and developing the virtue of prudence? What do we need to do there? How responsible are we for doing so? What happens if we, have a, if we lack prudence or have a poorly formed conscience? How responsible are we for our actions then? What is the relationship between responsibility and uh, the development of virtue? And then we also have this side discussion about perplexus, about uh, moral dilemma, which goes on for a page or so somehow. And then we also have this, this sem the somewhat extended discussion of adultery as well. Like All of this gets shoved into the shortest chapter in the book. So we have a lot to cover. Um, yeah. It covers a lot of ground in not a lot of pages. So if, if prudence is the virtue of knowing the appropriate means to achieve an end, what's conscience? What do we mean by conscience in this case? No? Well, it's controversial, so that's fair, I suppose. Um, it, it's controversial because there are some people who think that it means exactly the same thing as prudence. And there are some people who think that it means exactly the same thing as syndaresis. And there are some people who I think correctly think that it means something in between the two. That it's a separate, it's its own separate thing. Um, now, um, what he points out here is that uh, Aquinas argues that conscience is not technically a virtue. Just like syndaresis is not technically a virtue. Because it's not a character habit. It is not a habit of character. It's not a, uh, a way that we condition ourselves to act. It is merely the thought process that goes on. And so we can have habits which apply to conscience, which is basically what we just call a well-formed conscience. But conscience itself is just the act of thinking in a certain way properly or correctly. Right, so it's not quite technically a virtue. Same with syndaresis. Syndaresis, this, this technical term, just means our ability to grasp abstract ethical principles to understand what makes an action right or wrong, just intuitively, right? without having to go through ethical syllogisms and trying to figure things out uh, through careful logical analysis. Syndaresis is our ability to recognize, just immediately recognize, that kind of action is wrong, that kind of action is, is right, or praiseworthy or worth pursuing, or recognition of the good and or recognition of evil. OK, so if syndaresis is knowing, in other words, what our ends ought to be, our final ends, our most abstract ends. Abstract principles and, and, and ultimate ends, for the ultimate for the sake of which ends. The kind of stuff we've been talking about throughout the rest of the book. And then prudence is how do we achieve a particular end? What means do we need to employ and how do we do that to achieve that end? You can see why there might not be room for something in between those. right? If syndaresis is understanding our ends, what ends we should be pursuing, and prudence is how do we achieve our ends, you kind of, it seems like everything's covered, right? See what I mean? Because action really is just determining ends and then determining means towards those ends and then acting upon them. That, that's action. So what's conscience? Is it just prudence? Or is it the thing that prudence is a habit of so conscience is the particular action of figuring out what ends, are, uh, what ends are to be pursued and why and how, and prudence is doing that well, like the habit of doing that well. That's, uh, that's John Damascene that he points out here. Oh, not John Damascene. Um, Peeper, I believe it was. Joseph Peeper, I think. Talks about this somewhere. It's up here somewhere. That's one view. Right, is that conscience really is just the habit of syndaresis, or sorry, the thing that the habit of syndaresis does 
or the thing that the habit of prudence does. That's what conscience might be. But McInerney's position, which I also think is, Aris is uh, Aquinas's position, and I think is probably a better way of looking at it, is that conscience is to syndericis what science or knowledge is to understanding. Right? So conscience is the particularization of an abstract principle. So it's how we particularize an abstract. So syndericis gives us thoughts and ideas like, I shouldn't violate someone's trust. Say somebody has trusted me to do something because I promised or because they asked and, I've, and, they, and I'm a good friend or, right? Someone is trusting me to do something and so I should do it, right? That's what syndericis tells us, these abstract principles. Conscience says that this is an instance in which someone has justifiably placed their trust in me. So it takes this abstract principle and then particularizes it to the individual thing, right? to the individual case, let's say. Right. Syndericis tells me that, uh, that whales are not appropriate objects of sexual desire. Or, no, 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 not quite. Sindaricis tells me that human beings, that as a human being, other human beings are the appropriate objects of sexual desire. Conscience would then tell me that a whale is not a fellow human being and therefore I shouldn't fuck it. But John, John McAfee has a bit of a... History? I was going to say malformed conscience, but that too. That too. Now, how we got to that point, who knows? Um, How we got to the point where he has a malformed conscience, or how yes. we got to the point where we talked about it? That too. Well, all of that kind of goes together, right? Why would you think that having sex with a whale is a good idea? I don't know. I don't think it's like... Well, we talked about minnows, remember? Remember the minnows? Don't remember the minnows? What? Emperor Tiberius? We talked about this when we talked about Plato. So if you recall, um, I brought up the example of the Roman Emperor Tiberius, who had all sorts of incredibly horrific and deviant desires and things that he did. Not just sexual, sexual was part of it, but, but also political and power and, and interpersonal. And... The dude who was like calling people out, like, or was that a different dude? Might be right. We talked about a lot of people. It could be. Expand? Yeah, we talked about like people that were and he basically right. do it in front of a crowd and then embarrass them, and then eventually he got, he got like, a hit. He was executed by his, he, yeah, he was assassinated by his own guards, basically. Because um, that's what powerful people tend to have, that's what happens to powerful tyrants. Um, but yeah, no, he, uh, he did things like, um, Actually, it wasn't him. Uh, another example. Let's use another example. I have it before. Uh, Caligula's, uh, Caligula, who was Tiberius's son, who also has a reputation for being one of the mad emperors, um, he appointed a horse as consul, so as leader of the Senate. He's so rude for that. Yeah. His actual horse, like a, a, an equine. But at that point, what is it called? Um, it was a power play, right? That, that was the whole point. It's not even that. If he's appointing his own horse, it starts with an end. Nepotism? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> nepotism would be typically is someone you have you can control basically. Yeah, this wasn't what he was doing. Horse. It's his horse. That wasn't what he was doing though. You might think so. You might say, well, the horse wants this. He says, no, he didn't do that. He only he only allowed the Senate to conduct business that the horse called for. The horse did not call for business. The horse is a horse. He basically was saying, all right, senators. Go waste your time with my horse. I'm going to take to the business of ruling the empire. It was, a, it was a direct political insult to a lot of people he saw as beneath him. Uh, and so again, <clears throat> a lot of this is when you have particularly errant desires, well, those often will come from having uh, the power to achieve anything you damn well please. And so, you know, if you, if you 
you're somebody like John McAfee, who is, I mean, I won't say nearly as a, as a he's not a mad tyrant, certainly, or wasn't a mad tyrant, um, but he was certainly eccentric and not necessarily in all good ways um, because he was incredibly wealthy and he got that wealth as a, uh, as a tech security mogul. McAfee internet security, that guy. So basically he got a bunch of money and he got his bunch of money by being excessively paranoid and selling that paranoia to others. That does a number on your psychology, I think. And so in doing so, you wind up sort of distorting your, uh, your conscience, your ability to not just uh, discerning right from wrong is a bit too broad because that would be syndericist, but rather recognizing particular situations as instances of right or wrong kinds of situations. Recognizing that a whale is an inappropriate sexual partner rather than thinking, well, I can and, it's, and it could stop me if it wanted to. It's, it's taking a particular thought process and applying the wrong principles to it, in other words. That's a malformed conscience. A conscience that does not, uh, does not apply the proper principles that we get from Sundaris' to the right situations. So conscience on this model is basically the connection between the abstract principles and the yes, do it, or no, don't, and how do I do it? Because it tells us that this is good or this is bad, not that things are good and things are bad. Right? It tells us that this is a particular example. We've talked, again, uh, another example we've talked about is, uh, is the difference between uh, murder and homicide. Right? Because the question of, is something murder, is a question of, well, that's, that's how we ask whether killing someone might be wrong under what circumstances. Conscience is what tells us whether an instance of homicide is murder or not. By applying the principles we get from Sundaris's, like murder is inappropriate due to principles of self-defense, uh, things like the principle of double effect, um, uh, in, in gravest necessity under particular circumstances, things like that, or in just warfare, or whatever it might be, Sundaris's gives us these abstract principles. Conscience is, set, is what says this instance of homicide fits under one of the acceptable categories or not. And then prudence is how do I accomplish this in one, an effective way, two, a morally acceptable way. Right. So if you've judged that a particular instance of killing, of killing somebody, say in warfare, you're a soldier, and you need to kill an enemy soldier who is trying to uh, who is trying to invade your nation. Say, and you've determined that this is the right action to do. Prudence will then say, "Okay, how do I do that? Do I do I employ my weapons effectively and ethically? Do I go for the kill shot, or do I just wound? Well, that might depend on the circumstances, because if you can wound someone and remove the threat." in a way that won't be excessively cruel, that might be, a better, that might be a better use of your resources and a better way of doing something. But if you're going to wound someone who is alone and to be left in the desert, no, don't do that. That is suddenly an, a, an unethical use of the means that you have to achieve a particular end. Yes, this person is you know, an enemy combatant, is, is, a, is a direct threat. Wounding them will take them out of combat, but it would also leave them slowly to die out, out, say, alone in the desert sands, which is not something one want to do. Okay. So we see, again, this, this kind of where, where prudence is, how do I employ the means available to me to this end that conscience has said is an appropriate end because Sundaris says that this is the kind of end which is pursuable or, or appropriate or worth pursuing. So all three of these sort of can, or should, if they're working properly, work together. Questions so far on the working together of any of these? How these work, how they interrelate, how they differ, et cetera. All right. So there's a couple of other things that he, that he, that he brings up. We already kind of talked about perplexus, right? this idea of a, uh, of a strong moral dilemma, a case where you, have, uh, where you have no good option, where either choice that you make is going to be the wrong choice. 
And he does bring up a situation where you can actually have somebody in perplexus in a true moral dilemma, a case where it is, necessary, it is necessarily the case that you will do something wrong. You remember what that case was, or, case, or what kind of case that was? No? So it's the case of a malformed conscience. So this is that uh, this is the point where he makes that a um, a conscience, particularly a poorly formed conscience, can bind but not excuse. So we have a strong moral obligation to obey our conscience, to do what we have determined is the right thing to do, even if we're wrong. Right. Suppose I have determined that this instance of uh, of killing a civilian because I wanted their shoes is not a case of murder. Okay, great. I'm wrong about that. That is a case of murder, right? Under almost any circumstances I could possibly imagine, that would be def defined as murder. <clears throat> but I have come to the, the fully honest conclusion that that's not murder because I really want those shoes. No, but okay, maybe there's maybe there's an issue here of prudence. Maybe I can just threaten them for their shoes. But maybe my prudence is is somewhat malformed as well, and so so my malformed prudence says no, no, homicide is definitely the way of acquiring these shoes. Let's go with that. Sure. But again, we're we're working on a system here where uh, where we're looking at somebody with a with a poorly formed moral ethical decision making apparatus. Let's say. Someone who's not very good at making proper ethical decisions. This happens. This isn't, this isn't wildly unrealistic. People kill each other for, for sillier things, right? So if I've determined that, that killing this person for their shoes doesn't count as murder because I really want the shoes, and that murder is the most effective way and, and most ethically sound way of doing so, or not murder, killing. Not murder, because I don't think it's murder. Then what I do, what, what happens in that case is that it would be wrong of me to disobey my conscience. It would be wrong of me to attempt other means of acquiring the shoes or to leave the person alone. Because I've determined, as best I'm capable of doing, that this is the correct, proper course of action. However, on the other hand, because it obviously is murder and murder is obviously wrong, I also have an obligation not to murder the person, shoes notwithstanding. So if I do kill this person, I've committed murder, and that is wrong. If I don't kill this person, then I've disobeyed my conscience, and that is wrong. I'm stuck. There's nothing I can do. Whatever I do, I'm doing something horribly wrong. Now. For Aquinas, this is perfectly fine because my, um, my poor formation of my conscience is at least partially my fault. I should be able to figure out that that would be murder. There are no reasonable circumstances barring something that would make the act involuntary, like gross ignorance, like, like I, I genuinely do not recognize that it's a person somehow, like through, say, a psychotic episode, like a psychotic, psychotic episode or, uh, or uh, say, uh, drugs or, uh, or, you know, literally an accident. Um, like I happened to be holding a kitchen knife and I, I literally fell into someone because the ship I was on got rocked by a wave or something. That's not murder. That is quite literally, truly an accident. So you're not responsible for that sort of thing. But if you are responsible, if you're making the decision, you ought to be able to know that that is a case of murder. And because you don't, that's why you're in perplexus. That's why you're in this moral dilemma is because your, your conscience is malformed and that's your fault. It shouldn't be malformed in that way to that degree. You should know better and you don't. And because you don't know better, you don't know what to do correctly. And because you don't know what to do correctly, you're going to do something wrong either way. So that's, that's where this, this moral dilemma idea comes, in, comes into play with respect to conscience. 
exactly. That, that's the phrase he uses, in fact. Yeah. Now, there's another concern here, uh, and this is the relativism concern. Because we say, well, what about uh, what we say that conscience binds, right? That we have an obligation to follow our conscience. That it that we ought to follow our conscience. That morally speaking or ethically speaking, disobeying our conscience is wrong. Okay, but what if people's what if two people have uh, have consciences that disagree? The example here being adultery, what if I happen to genuinely, what if I have genuinely come to the conclusion that adultery is just fine and somebody else uh, say, uh, say the person I am cheating on or cheating with has come to the conclusion that it is not just fine, that that is wrong. How do we resolve the matter? Is one of us right? Is one of us wrong? Has one of us behaved ethically or unethically? How do we resolve this situation? It certainly seems like if we have this disagreement at a level of conscience and we have an obligation to follow our conscience, then, well, if our consciences disagree, then ethics seems to disagree. We have two competing obligations, mine and yours, say. Okay. Now that's part of what's wrong with it. But the question, the question at hand is, if they think it's okay, genuinely, like honestly, like upon honest reflection, not like they're just telling themselves that and it's self-deception or anything like that. Like they genuinely, honestly think that it's perfectly fine. Is it? Because again, they have an obligation to obey their conscience. Their conscience tells them that Fifi LaRue over there is quite attractive and ought to be slept with. Again, to use his example. I'll come back. I would say no, but it would also depend on their society's like structure back then, like what they deemed as okay or not. But thinking about that, it, I wouldn't necessarily say that society should be a well, that also starts to that starts to collapse as well because you're you're taking the same you're taking the same uh, relativism problem and just making it larger, saying that well it's not the individual that decides entirely at least it's the society that decides. But then a society in general is a microcosm of reality. It is it's still it's it's not strictly subjective, but it is intersubjective. It's just say. Um, broad agreement between large numbers of people that needn't include the individual, first of all. You can disagree with society. People do it all the time. We all probably do it all the time, individually as well. But then further, um, it's, it's still something like arbitrary, right? because different societies think different things, clearly, right? whether that's across the world or across history. And so, one of the things that he points out here, one of the counter arguments to this, to this potential relativism, whether that's interpersonal or intersocietal, is that if you are saying, my conscience tells me, or I think this action is right, and someone else says, I think that action is wrong, or my conscience tells me that action is wrong, if all they mean by that is, I think it's right for me to do, then there's still a disagreement going on. Right, if that's the case, there's still a disagreement going on. Right. Well, if one person thinks that it's okay for them to do, then immediately their entire argument falls apart if they don't think that the other person thinks that it's a lot to do it. Because what makes them so stuck? Well, let's, let's, let's go concretely. Um, so suppose I'm having a conversation with, uh, with Al the adulterer. There we go. Let's go with him. Let's go with him. a man named Al who who thinks adultery is perfectly fine, oh. at least in his case. 
Al thinks that he is perfectly justified in, in cheating on his wife with Fifi LaRue, the example from the text. OK, great. I disagree with him. I think that that, it would, be, that would be an inappropriate thing for him to do. I think that that is, uh, that is disloyal. I think that it is, it is uh, irresponsible. Uh, I think that it is, uh, it is a kind of uh, mismatch between one's, uh, between one's prior commitments and one's current actions, all sorts of things, right? Okay. Um, and I say, no, Al, you shouldn't do that. And he says, no, I think I should. I'd ask why if I were in that situation. If you were Al or if you were me? If I were you. Okay, so Al says that I think it's perfectly appropriate because um, I, because I, speaking as Al, right, or let, let's use third person. Al thinks that, uh, that the pursuit of a, particular, uh, of a particular desire will lead to his fulfillment in this particular circumstance. His, his overall well-being and flourishing. And that the reason that he married his wife in the first place, call her Alice, because in philosophical thought experiments, everyone's name starts with A, B, or C. Um, right? The reason that Al married Alice in the first place was for the purpose of his overall, uh, and maybe even their mutual fulfillment, their overall uh, well-being and happiness. And in this case, that same end will be fulfilled with, uh, fulfilled by having an affair with Fifi LaRue. Now, I can, I can argue with Al, and I can tell him that that's, that's incorrect, that you're mistaken about that. That no, this will not, in fact, lead to your overall flourishing and happiness, because what you're doing is you are acting contrary to your prior commitments. You're acting contrary to, your, uh, to the life that you have, you have laid out for yourself, that you are, uh, that you are acting um, you are treating Fifi LaRue as, uh, as something like a mere object of pleasure rather than as a, uh, as a, uh, as a total union that is, that is implied by the act. Things like this, like all, these, all of these sorts of things that I could point out are wrong. But Al says, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't really, I, that, doesn't really seem, that doesn't seem right to me. My conscience tells me that this is the right thing to do because this seems to be a, an act of the kind ultimate fulfillment of, uh, of important desires. So, ow. It happens all the time. And so if we do in fact disagree, then we're not saying it's, right, Al isn't saying it's right for me and I'm saying it's wrong for me. Al is saying it's right for him and I'm saying it's wrong for him. <coughs> because I'm saying it's wrong in general. Our disagreement is on the um, on the general level of applicability of abstract rules to concrete situations. I'm aware of the details of the concrete situation because presumably Al and I have discussed it sufficiently. We're hanging out at the bar and have been talking about it. Because that's usually, by the way, that is usually the trouble with judging somebody else's circumstances, is you don't know the circumstances. So that's why we should be very hesitant and very careful about saying whether what somebody else has done is right or wrong. Hence the importance of taking our steps very slowly when we do the case analyses to make sure that we're aware of all of the relevant details of the situation. I digress. The point being, though, is that if we are in fact disagreeing, that means that what we mean by this is right or this is wrong is something beyond simply the demands of conscience. That the demands of conscience can demand correctly or incorrectly. That his conscience, by saying that having an affair with Fifi LaRue is a good idea, can be mistaken. And if it is, then he would be wrong to follow it. But he would be also wrong not to follow it. What he should do instead is to rethink matters, reconsider and realign his conscience with reality, which can be difficult and take you know, time and effort and careful analysis and thinking and studying and, and practice and so it might not be a, an immediate, hey, just think about what you're doing here. Well, he might have thought, what he, thought about what he was doing and come to the conclusion that, no, this wrong thing is actually right. And that, that's what gets him into what we were talking about, this kind of perplexes. So the other alternative is, of course, if I just mean um, that by, if, if what I mean by saying that action is wrong is that my conscience disapproves of it, and what you mean by saying, or what Al means, say, by saying that action is right, is that 
Al's, Al's conscience approves of it, then we're not disagreeing because we're not even talking about actions anymore. We're now just talking about sort of internal sentiments. And if that's all we're talking about, we're not talking about the actions, we're not talking about the rightness or wrongness, we're not talking about their ends, we're not talking about their, their, uh, the, the ways that we might enact them, we're just talking about something strictly internal. And so we're not talking about ethics anymore. So if we are going to talk about ethics, it is the kind of thing that we have to treat as, uh, as something with an external object, something that is, that is objective, at least in that sense, in the sense that there is an aspect of it that that our subjective analysis has to sort of align with, let's say. So there's a subjective aspect to ethics, which is that the circumstances are very particular to the individual, but how those circumstances interact with the general principles is objective in the sense that it is stable, it's recognizable, and you, you don't, the only reason you might need to be in a particular position in order to make that judgment is so that you're fully aware of the situation. 